Welcome, everybody. My name is Osa Flory, and I'm a member of the Northampton Area League of Women Voters. So glad you have taken time to attend this forum. Tonight, tonight we have an opportunity to learn why candidates are willing to, pup, to participate in the public race for the job of being the county sheriff of Hampshire County. This position comes with a job guarantee of six years. Then the voters may choose to elect a different person. Tonight, we will learn a lot about what exactly a sheriff's job is all about and why somebody would apply for a job for just six, a six-year guarantee. There are three Democrats and one Republican contesting for this position. The three Democratic candidates are with us tonight. Our three candidates are Patrick Cahillin, Kevin Lewis, and Melissa Perry. Welcome and thank you for participating. I now ask everybody to turn off your cell phones. We wish to thank you all who make tonight's event possible, the Daily Hampshire Gazette, uh, the Northampton Community TV, WHMP, the Northampton Area League, and the Amherst League of Women Voters, and of course, the candidates. The event is not televised live, but can be viewed on your community TV station tomorrow evening. This program can also be viewed on the Gazette website, which is part of the gazettenet.com. When you arrived, you were handed paper and pencil to write your questions. League members will collect questions throughout the evening. We ask that questions be limited to, six, to 30 seconds. If there are duplicate questions, only one will be asked, or if similar, similar may be combined into one question. Cynthia Brubaker of the Amherst League of Women Voters and Laura Dintino of the Daily Hampshire Gazette will organize audience questions. You, they're sitting in the back. Stan Moulton of the Daily Hampshire Gazette, Stephanie Sliss of WHMP WRSI have prepared questions for the candidates as well. Jean Chordak, member of the Northampton League, will read the questions from the audience. And we will alternate their and the audience questions. Our candidates will introduce themselves with a three-minute opening statement. We have league members here in front who will keep us at the timetable. Candidates will see a 30-second sign and then stop uh, a stop sign and hear the alarm when the bell, when the time is up. Candidates will have 90 seconds maximum to answer questions. The order of questions will alternately be from left to right and then right to left. I and the tracker in the front row will help keep order. Candidates will see their name sign held by the tracker when it's their turn. Candidates may have 30 seconds rebuttal time once to each question if they wish. At 8.30 p.m., the candidates will be asked to make a two-minute closing statement. Uh, we drew uh, lots for who would make the first opening statement and you will do that. Absolutely. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Kavon Lewis. Um, I was raised in Baltimore, Maryland. Um, I've been here for 10 years on and off. I uh, have experience in law enforcement, correction, and security. Uh, I was a police officer in D.C. and Charleston, South Carolina, and corrections in the state of Vermont in their prison. Um, the sheriff originated from uh, England, basically, and uh, the first sheriff was actually uh, elected in uh, Virginia uh, in 1634. Um, and his primary duties were to protect the law of the land. Um, and basically, with that, as the years came about, uh, the reason why I decided to run was uh, based on my experience and uh, based on the needs of the community. Uh, the community has changed since, you know, 20, 40 years ago. Um, and I think it's important that uh, we kind of give back to the community in the aspect of uh, youth engagement, um, rehabilitation, and um, community engagement. Um, with that being said, it, getting involved in the school system 
uh, is ideal. And when I say that, being there as a mentor for the kids, not going there and arresting them just for these you know, fights that they're into and stuff like that. Uh, being there as a peer mediator and a mentor. Um, on the correctional side of it, um, I, I think it's important to support these correctional officers. Um, one, one, one thing that I remember is, is a correctional officer, it's a tough job. And it's totally different from being a police officer. Um, you're, you're, you're in this closed environment surrounded by most um, violent criminals and some are not violent. Um, and during my time inside of these, these walls, I, I realized that you know, most of these individuals are not bad people. And my job uh, as your next sheriff is to make sure that once they get into our system that we turn their lives around and um, you know, so that they're accepted back in society. Thank you. Okay. And uh, next we'll hear from Mr. Cahilling. Good evening. Thank you, everybody, for hosting this debate. Uh, I'm proud of the amount of people that have shown up on a warm summer night. My name is Patrick Cahilling, and I have been a public ser servant for over 30 years. I was a member of the Massachusetts Army National Guard, and I am a correctional officer for the Hampshire County Sheriff's Office. Today I live in Leeds with my wife and two dogs. And I am proud to say that I am the father of three wonderful young women. I say I'm a public servant, and I believe that service is the most important part of what we do. Being a correctional officer is not a job to me. It's who I am. I've worked for the department for over these 30 years, and I have raised through the ranks. I'm now the assistant superintendent at the facility. I'm proud of the work that our staff do every day in making this community safe by providing treatment and programming for those who are coming back to the community. We build an arch, A-R-C-H. We, we get the inmates to acknowledge that they have wrongdoings. We recognize that they have problems. We get them to commit to change their ways. And we try to reconnect them to society in harmony. This is a well-trained staff, <coughs> correctional officers, case managers, maintenance, administrative staff, medical and food services. They work together each day to perform their part for what public safety has to be in Hampshire County. The department consists of 168 staff. They manage four site, on-site buildings, three off-site facilities. We supervise roughly 240 clients each day at the main facility and approximately 40 more off-site. We serve civil process throughout Hampshire County and we transport people that are arrested and for other jurisdictions across the state on a daily basis. Our latest project is the Bridge to the Future House. I'm proud to say that that was a collective uh, grant offering between the state and local jurisdiction. And the reentry house is for commitments back to the community to include those with opioid, opioid addictions who are trying to get treatment and help in the community. We also provide safety services to senior citizens through our triad program. We operate on several task forces. We operate the first standalone regional police lockup, which I was the co-chair person of the building and design. And because of these issues, I want to continue to be, be a part of this community and work as the next sheriff of Hampshire County. Thank you. Thank you. Melissa Perry. I'd like to thank everybody for who hosted um, this event and also everybody um, who's attended. I appreciate the large crowd. And my name is Melissa Perry and I'm a candidate for the Hampshire County Sheriff's Department. I am um, a resident of Northampton and I am currently the Director of Behavioral Health Nursing at Hoyoke Medical Center. I manage over 100 staff members, including nurses, clinicians, social workers, and secretaries. I have a degree in criminal justice, psychology, and I'm a registered nurse. 
I have excellent interpersonal skills, and I was voted number one leader out of 120 leaders for Valley Health Systems in 2015. I manage a very large budget. I am a mental health and substance abuse expert. I have worked collaboratively with treatment agencies, health providers, the departments of mental health, public health, and the Bureau of Substance Abuse Services to provide a quality, collaborative approach to the treatment of those who suffer from mental illness and substance abuse. These qualifications certainly would be significant to the Sheriff's Office currently due to the fact that a large number, 60 to 70 percent of all of those incarcerated have a behavioral health or substance abuse diagnosis. I am the granddaughter of the late Sheriff John F. Boyle. My parents were both correctional officers and I had much exposure growing up to the Hampshire County Jail and House of Correction and I worked at the jail as an intern. Seeing the work performed by my parents and my grandfather helped form my passion for helping those in need and to assist those who have taken the wrong path and assist them to get, getting back on the right path. I have done much for behavioral health in the hospital and the community. I have brought persons with lived experience together with staff at the hospital, security officers, to share experiences from both sides, which has proven to be a very powerful experience for, for all of those who participated. I have worked hard to make sure all of my staff and the staff of the hospital have a very humanistic approach to all situations. I have worked hard to decrease the use of restraints at my facility and have been successful in doing so by reducing them by two-thirds. I have been a consultant to many hospitals throughout the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, and I have shared with them my treatment approaches for behavioral health patients. The state licensing board during their last visit stated that my inpatient psychiatric unit was one of the best, if not the best run psychiatric facility in the state of Massachusetts. I feel we need to house those incarcerated in a safe and secure environment and importantly, foster job satisfaction and teamwork and provide education for those who work in the facility. Ensure everyone is treated with respect and dignity. I would like to provide ongoing education to the staff at the jail on a variety of unique needs of people incarcerated and I have that experience and the ability to train. I would like to provide rehabilitation for those incarcerated with educational and vocational opportunities offer programming for those who suffer with mental health and substance abuse disorders. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. And now we will start the questions. Um, Stan Moulton will be asking the first question. And um, Mr. Kahilane will be the first to answer. And then we go down the road like that. Thank you, Osa. Uh, what are your top priorities as sheriff? And what skills, professional, and life experiences would you bring to that job that make you more qualified to carry out those priorities than your opponents? The top priorities at this point will be to continue our operation as it is now and to move it forward, especially when we're discussing uh, such topics as opioid crisis and mental health issues. We have led in many of these aspects across the state and we want to continue to lead. As far as uh, what I bring to the table in this situation, I am educated uh, at Westfield State University with a bachelor's degree in criminal justice. I have a master's degree in criminal justice administration from uh, Western New England College, now Western New England University. I am the only candidate and the only person in Western Massachusetts who possesses the uh, job title of um, correctional administrator certified by the American Jail Association. Those are, those are three of the pieces. Um, along with that, I have spent over the last 30 years working for this facility day in and day out to make sure that it's a better place for both the staff and the inmates and uh, I want to continue uh, to, do the, to do that job. Thank you, and now Kevin Lewis. Um, mine is rehabilitation, uh, youth engagement, and uh, community engagement. Um, 
You know, I, th I think at this point in 2016, uh, there's, there, there's been a lot of changes. And I think it's important that we bring the Sheriff's Department back into the, uh, the modern day um, in the aspect of getting more involved in the community. Um, as we hear what's going on everywhere else in the nation about, sorry, about, um, you know, the shootings uh, versus police versus the community, community versus the police. And before it ends up in our neighborhood, we need to prevent that. We need to come together as one and stop segregating ourselves from uh, each other. Um, the things that I bring to the table, not only professionally, but personally, uh, is, is just being a, more of a real person, uh, dealing with real issues. Um, for, for instance, growing up uh, in Baltimore, Maryland, was a really tough, tough city to live in. Um, and, and then coming uh, here 10 years ago uh, was a huge uh, cultural shock, per, per se. Um, when I was younger, I was homeless, didn't have anywhere else to go, um, and just uh, growing up in poverty. Um, so dealing with real issues, I think uh, you guys deserve a individual that uh, can relate to the community in that aspect. Thank you. Thank you. Melissa? Hi. I, um, my top priorities um, when elected sheriff would be to, um, one, provide excellent leadership for the staff and um, foster positivity, respect, and dignity. Because I think if the staff have that, it translates over to um, the people who are incarcerated. I'd also like to promote more rehabilitation, more post-incarceration programming, as well as um, continue to build affiliations with educational facilities, vocational facilities, and other public agencies. Again, I think what I bring to the table is the fact that I have the experience behind me as far as running um, an inpatient unit. I have the staff leadership skills. And um, again, I think my experience will be extremely helpful um, in providing um, leadership to the staff and education to the staff. Thank you. Thank you. Stan, you want to ask? But, no, Stephanie. Okay, Stephanie. Hi. The use of solitary confinement or isolation has been condemned by the international community as cruel, inhumane, or degrading treatment or punishment. But the U.S. continues to use isolation as the country with the most prisoners in these conditions and disproportionately isolating prisoners of color. The Hampshire County House of Corrections can house up to 24 prisoners in solitary confinement at one time. As sheriff, will you use punishment of isolating prisoners despite the research su suggesting negative psychological consequences? And if so, how long is too long in isolation? How long is too long? Um, I think too long is, is more than 10 days. Um, you know, being behind uh, those walls, uh, having really nothing to do, um, no one to speak to, um, I, I, I think that really sends an individual crazy. Um, and I think anybody in here can agree with me, um, if you're in a small environment 24-7 and you only have one hour to you know, be out in the wreck, per se, um, you know, whether it's reading a book or talking on the phone or anything like that, and you just get one hour a day for that, that's gonna send you insane. And you're gonna be extremely upset once they release you um, from that. So I do not believe in that. Um, you know, the most, you know, I would say is five days, uh, somebody to be in, um, to be in there. But, you know, it all depends on if that individual is, you know, a, a, a huge risk to general population, which would be inside the, uh, the jail walls. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I have to say on a personal level, solitary confinement um, is very difficult for me to think about. I realize that there are situations where people are um, a danger to themselves or others. However, um, the Department of Mental Health has worked hard to eliminate seclusion on their psychiatric, um, in their psychiatric facilities. And solitary confinement, from my perspective, I think, again, we would need to daily assess someone's risk to themselves and others. Um, to decide whether or not solitary is re needed. And that would be one of the things that I would like to change. I really have a hard time on a personal level, and I, I certainly could not be in uh, a room locked up 23 hours a day. I, could, I couldn't do it. So I don't know if anybody else could, but I couldn't. Thank you. 
Mr. Kaling? There is a misunderstanding of what the term solitary confinement is. In Hampshire County, we do have 24 cells that are used for protection of inmates from themselves, protection of inmates from others, and protection of, of inmates uh, that have been assaultive towards staff. That doesn't mean that all 24 cells are used at all times, and that has to be uh, understood. That being said, I'm not a proponent of solitary confinement, and solitary confinement indicates that you have no connection with anybody. In Hampshire County, there has to be shift supervisors who visit the unit. There has to be nursing staff that have to visit the unit and visit the inmates. And there has to be a clinician who visits the unit and visits the inmates that are in there. Most of the individuals that are kept there are kept there because they are a danger to others. So based on that, we would continue the practice that we have at the present time. We try very hard not to have individuals end up in that unit. So we work to keep them in an open population with everybody else because we understand that that is the best option for both the staff and the inmates. And it keeps the staff and the inmates safer if they work together to try to keep out of those units. Thank you. We'll now take a question from Jean Shordak from the public, please. Sure. <clears throat> it, has, it has been said that the U.S. correctional system has unwittingly become the country's largest mental health provider. The opioid crisis must also be having a local effect on the problems of our inmates. How would you address the interface between addiction, mental health, and incarceration? That one's a good one for me. <laughs> <laughs> um, so again, um, I, th this is the exact reason why I am in this race. I struggle with the fact that 60 to 70 percent of those incarcerated um, suffer with mental illness or substance abuse. And I think my goal would be to work with public agencies and trying to get these um, people to have um, services and treatment programs as alternatives possibly um, to incarceration. And also I've learned recently that the Department of Corrections budget has increased dramatically as the Department of Mental Health budget has dropped dramatically. And I was one of the first, pe I was one of the people that actually took people out of the state hospital in the late 80s, early 90s. And I struggle with the fact, have we turned the tables now? Have we now um, incarcerated those with mental health who used to be in the state hospitals? I'm not, I'm not quite sure exactly, but it seems to me that would make sense because of the um, budget changes. Mr. Kalin? You cannot compare the rest of the Commonwealth to Hampshire County when it comes to both mental health and opioid addiction. This community is a caring community, and I've discovered that firsthand with many of the people that I come in contact with. And so what we discover is there is 20% of our population that has serious mental health issues. We spend a great deal of our time taking those individuals and getting them to a different location than the Hampshire County Jail, hopefully to a better place. That's 20%. The opioid addiction crisis, if anyone has read, Hampshire County had the lowest death rate in 2015 from opioid overdoses. I would suggest to you that is in part because of the uh, collaboration of agencies, including the Hampshire County Sheriff's Office, who has worked hard uh, on the opioid addiction problem, not always on the front page of the paper, but working day in and day out to make sure that we have uh, situations in place where we can get people to different programs and not into the jail system. We do not choose who come to the uh, facility, but we can get them to a better place if they are, in fact, in need of services. Thank you. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to agree with Patrick. Um, but here in Hampshire County, the deaths may be low, but I don't know if you guys have read the paper lately, but in Ware, the deaths are pretty high, just in the town of Ware. 
Mm -hmm. um, and that's the highest in the Commonwealth, period. And um, so with that being said, yes, there may be 20 percent, you know, within the jail, but that's still high. And that's th still something that we need to take care of. We need to remove them, period. I mean, if their crimes are, are, are extremely uh, dangerous, then that's a different story. We're going to work on that. But just for having mental health or substance abuse, I don't believe they belong in the jail, period. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Stan, it's your turn. Outside of supervising uh, the jail and its programs, what role would you play as sheriff, uh, as a leading law enforcement official in the community? Melissa? Oh, I'm sorry. Um, I would actually want to work with the police departments and other local agencies. I see the role as a link between all of these places, facilities, um, agencies, so that we can provide better care for those people who may be incarcerated or, again, alternatives. So that would be my goal, would be to be out there pounding the pavement, trying to talk to people, to come together, to come up with solutions for the issues that are before us today. Building a better relationship with uh, our local and state law enforcement, assisting them uh, when the other is not available. Uh, for instance, when you go up to the hill towns, you know, most of the hill towns, they have part-time police officers, and uh, they, don't have, they don't have the requirements for uh, canine units, for instance, and the sheriff's department has the, the resources for that. Um, another, another aspect, like I said earlier, was getting involved in a school. The youth is our future, and education is, is huge, um, and I think educating our youth um, is you know, the best bet as of right now. Um, you know, it, it's, it, like I said before, it's 2016 and things have definitely changed. Um, and this election is nothing more but about change. Um, and I think we need to kind of open our eyes and realize that, you know, if, if we don't change what has not worked in the past and look towards the future and actually um, uh, open our eyes and actually um, allow change, things are going to get better. Thank you. There probably isn't a day that goes by that our agency does not get contacted by some outside law enforcement agency asking for some assistance in some manner. That may be anything from uh, would you consider uh, working with our folks on uh, delivering a dog kennel or making a dog uh, center work for this area because there's lack of uh, animal care uh, and animal shelters. Those are the types of questions that come up on a routine basis. Police departments, there are 20 police departments in Hampshire County, 20 local police departments. There are two state police barracks in Hampshire County. There are several, there are five police departments on the campuses, the, the uh, college campuses, and on top of that, there's uh, the environmental police. And I've probably missed a couple of agencies in there. There is a lot of policing going on in Hampshire County, all the way through the hill towns and through the valley. Our role is to augment those services when asked by the police departments. It is not our role to go out into the law enforcement community and decide that it should be our, uh, our job to police the streets of Hampshire County. Thank you. Stephanie? Research suggests underlying trauma, particularly in childhood, results in specific changes in the brain, which lead to increased rates of addiction, incarceration, and institutional violence later in life. In recognition of this, a relatively new approach called trauma-informed care has been developed. Some correctional facilities have recently augmented staff training on trauma. Are you familiar with trauma-based care, and does the Hampshire County House of Corrections provide adequate support fo focused on trauma-based care? Mr. Lewis? I am not familiar with it, so I can't really answer that. Mr. Kaling? I am not familiar with trauma-based care as, as a work, but uh, we deal day in and day out with individuals who have 
uh, issues, brain injuries, and, and those types of situations where we do uh, look at it from a medical perspective and not a criminal justice perspective. Uh, and on the medical end, we will make sure that that individual goes to the appropriate services, either in, inside the facility or outside of the facility based on their need. Ms. Perry? Um, I think um, you're making reference to the infamous ACE study that was done by Kaiser Permanente, where there were um, several people at Kaiser out in Colorado who were followed and they were given questionnaires on their trauma. And they followed them for several years and realized, and the numbers are astounding as far as the number of folks who su suffered trauma in their childhood, who suffer from substance abuse, mental health issues, suicide, and also um, early deaths. And if you have an opportunity to look at it, it's very, very, it's a very interesting study. I absolutely advocate for in, uh, trauma-informed care. I have been to multiple um, uh, conferences on trauma-informed care, and my unit that I manage currently um, is um, well-versed in trauma-informed care, informed care when we practice it um, on a daily basis. Jean Jordak. What suggestions do you have to encourage residents of the jail to feel they belong to the larger community? For example, the Florence Community Band plays one concert for them every year, and they really appreciate it. Mr. Kaling? Uh, the community uh, is a big part of what we do at Hampshire County Jail. Uh, and the Florence Band is one of many outside agencies that come in and spend a great number of hours uh, both working with the inmate population and working with the clients to make sure that they understand what it is part, uh, to be part of the bigger community. Uh, right now we have a project with the Young at Heart Chorus where they're in uh, the facility once a week and the Young at Heart Chorus uh, is teaching individuals the, the idea of music, but how music interacts with the rest of life. We do that with art. We do it with, uh, um, in some cases, uh, we have a sewing project that we do where we sew uh, bags for some of the local stores um, so that they're giving back. Those are the inside projects, and there's a whole series of other projects that we do on the outside to, uh, to give back to the community as well. Um, I'm, I'm sure I'll have a chance to talk about those later. Melissa Perry, please. Um, as far as offering um, things for those people incarcerated, I would, again, want to be out talking to as many people and as, get as many opportunities for those people incarcerated because anything, any type of um, activity, that comes into the jail, any type of activity or training um, people incarcerated can get is going to bolster their self-esteem. Because I do know that when um, people are incarcerated, their self-esteem is in the toilet. And like I said, I would try and get as many opportunities for these folks as I possibly could so that I think in the long run, it would decrease recidivism um, back into the jail or the revolving door into the jail. More, more likely, exactly like uh, Melissa said, you know, reaching out to resources within the community, um, you know, finding out these uh, inmates' talents, um, you know, whether it's construction, whether you know, if they like to act, you know, if if there's a if there's an instructor inside of you know Smith College or something like that, and they want to come in and teach them a little bit of acting courses and stuff like that, then they can do that. Um, you know, on a volunteer basis. Uh, same thing, you know, you want to be a mechanic. You know, there's, there's programs like that. Uh, these individuals are only in there for, you know, the most two and a half years. And I think, you know, it's, it's important to, you know, turn their life around as much as we can and, you know, let them know that you will be accepted back in society. You know, let them intern into, you know, jobs, uh, for instance. So, thank you. Thank you. Stan Moulton? 
Uh, the recidivism rate at the Hampshire County Jail, which was mentioned uh, uh, in answer to the last question, is between 19 and 25 percent, depending on the amount of programming that's completed by an inmate. What specific ideas do you have to try to reduce that rate even further? Mr. Kaling. 20 percent may sound large. But there were times over the last 30 to 40 years where the percentage was more in the area of 50 percent. So we have worked day in and day out to try to reduce this rate. Um, we don't stop working on it, but 20 percent of a total population. We cannot get everybody to take our programs. We cannot, by law, be forced into a situation where we force them to, to take programs. Some people come to us and they choose not to participate in programming, you know, even though we try everything we can. And, and the staff works very hard at trying to get them to take as many programs as possible. Our goal is to get them, if, they, if they're not at a, at a GED level, get them to a, what is called now the high set uh, profile, get them to the high set level and then maybe get them to education outside of the facility. Education is one of the keys that we, we focus on with individuals because it's important to at least have the equivalency of a high school diploma to at least get a job back in our society. Thank you. Karen Lewis, please. Uh, education is key. Um, I, I definitely believe in that. Um, I think it's important that you know, like I said uh, previously, is to, you know, get in these inmates' heads and, and, and try to figure out what they specialize in, what exactly they can do, and then, you know, piggyback off of that. Um, you know, find out where they see themselves in the next five years, because it's, you know, hopefully it's not going to be jail. Um, you know, and then just work with them on that aspect. If they're, if they're good at, you know, construction work or, you know, they want to be in landscaping and, you know, different things like that. Try to find out or, or, or try to find a way that, you know, you can get them that particular job, per se, uh, whether it's, like I said, interning uh, and things like that, working with uh, resources out in the community to make sure that they don't return back to our uh, jail. Thank you. Melissa? Currently at um, Hoyoke Medical Center, where I work, I'm actually implementing a $3.9 million grant that has to do with recidivism to our emergency department for behavioral health and substance abusers. And the um, keys to our success thus far has been in getting out into the community and meeting people where they're at, um, going out into the streets and talking to people, seeing if there's ways that we can decrease barriers um, that prevent them from coming, I mean, that make them come back in. I would like to possibly explore that option um, in the um, correctional system. And certainly, um, like Yvonne was saying, you know, educational opportunities, vocational opportunities, and anything that we can do to make the person that's incarcerated feel more solid, feel more secure, and again, have a, a much higher self-esteem when they walk out the door and feel like they have the ability to succeed. Thank you. Stephanie? Franklin County Sheriff Chris Donnellan established the first family drug court in the Commonwealth with its opening this year in Greenfield. Do you see a need for a drug court or family drug court in Hampshire County? Why or why not? Drug court. Um, well, that boils down to money. Um, you know, once again, uh, you know, our, our, our deaths here in Hampshire County are extremely low. Um, you know, and Greenfield is definitely not too far away. Um, but if we can have one here, yeah, absolutely. Uh, I think that would be a good idea to support our community. Anything that's going to be supporting our community is, uh, you know, I'm definitely on board for. Thank you, Melissa. Absolutely, if there was a, a way to have a drug court and a mental health court um, somewhere in Hampshire County, I would totally advocate that because it's definitely a diversion to incarceration and people are giving treatment um, instead of incarceration and they're go to the appropriate settings rather than being locked in cells. So absolutely. Thank you. Mr. Kaling. Judge Richard Carey, when he was sitting here in Hampshire County, actually ran a drug court in this in this jurisdiction 
and uh, utilized it very well during the period of time that he was here. The problem comes down to state funding, and the state funding process for courts is spread out throughout the Commonwealth, and it's very hard in Hampshire County to get the same resources as places uh, such as Franklin County, where they had a much more serious opioid, opioid epidemic, and that was uh, the predicament that Franklin County was in, and the, and the judges or the uh, court decided that it was in the best interest of the citizens of the Commonwealth to open that court. The Veterans Court that opened in Holyoke uh, just a, a couple of months ago is another great idea. Um, and we, we fluctuate in between these two counties. And we have resources that we utilize from both of those courts to help us with the individuals that we have here. Thank you. Jean Jordak. As sheriff, do you plan to open a facility similar to Howard Street in order to address the addiction crisis? Ms. Perry? Absolutely. I would, I would love to be able to do um, a, a facility like Western Mass Correctional Al Alcohol Center. I think it's very progressive. Um, they have good programming there. I have seen much success through WIMCAC, and uh, like I said, absolutely, I would support it. Again, it's funding. Mr. Kaling? It is not necessary to open a facility here uh, for, for that piece because it is a Western Massachusetts alcohol and substance abuse treatment facility. It is designed for the four Western counties as well as Worcester County. And I have been a participant in many of their activities at uh, the Western Mass Alcohol Treatment Center. Uh, and we are an active participant on a daily basis. Uh, I believe uh, as of today we've, we had 23 individuals from Hampshire County who are in the program in that jurisdiction. Now what happens at the end, once they have completed that program, they come back to Hampshire County and we take them into a minimum security setting. And once we get them through a minimum security reentry program, we, move, we try to move them to the Bridge to the Future home, which we opened 18 months ago, so that they could reacclimate to the community and find a, a substance abuse sponsor in the community. This was something that we wrote a grant for. I, I'm, I was proud to be part of that. It works well, and we put people back in this community that belong in this community that are from Hampshire County. Thank you. I think we should. Uh, open one here as well. Um, you know, I'm sure there's waiting list, mm -hmm. um, and that's something that we've had a huge problem with. You know, with beds for rehabilitation centers, is that waiting list. Um, so opening another one, why not? I think it'd be a great idea. Um, you know, we we would be supporting our particular community, um, and I think it's a great idea. Thank you. Stand Can I have 30 oh, seconds sure. on yes, that? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Just to make a point on this process, there is just a limited amount of funds that are given every year to the criminal justice system in Massachusetts. So that money has to be spent wisely. And the way you spend money wisely is you pool the resources. That's why the Western Mass Alcohol Treatment Center was opened. That's why we send people there and then bring them back. That doesn't mean treatment stops or doesn't start until they get there. As soon as they come in the door, they're assessed for their substance abuse process, and then we get them into the best pro place that they can. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay, Stan? Okay, I'm gonna follow up on that question of, of uh, money, uh, which has come up in the answer to the last uh, couple of questions. Given that limited amount of money that's available from the state, what would be your top priority uh, for new money, if it came to you in Hampshire County as sheriff, what would you do with it? Melissa Perry? Um, I would actually, first of all, want to assess the condition of the facility itself. Um, and then secondly, would want to um, put the monies into programming both for incarcerated folks and for those um, who are uh, being released from the um, jail and house of correction. Again, 
I have said this before at forums that running the inpatient psychiatric unit, I cannot tell you how many people who have been released from um, the uh, correctional facilities in Western Mass who come to my emergency department claiming to be suicidal because they have no money, they have no place to go, they have no meds, they, they have no treatment follow-up. So again, I think that that would be money um, well, well worth spending. Thank you. Kevin Lewis? The House of Corrections and the jail, it's, it's, it's really important that we um, try our best to um, not let these uh, individuals return back to jail. Um, this money, I would definitely use it to, you know, help these individuals find a job, um, you know, and, you know, get them the necessary training while they're incarcerated um, to make sure that when they get out, uh, they, they can get this job. You know, most of these individuals are homeless. Uh, so what are we going to do about that? Just let them walk out of our doors and now they have nowhere to go. As soon as winter hits, they're going to commit a crime and return right back into our, our system. And it's going to be a never-ending cycle. So, you know, it, it's really important to look at the broad aspect of, you know, what exactly are these individuals doing with themselves once they uh, leave our jail. Thank you. Mr. Kaylin? Well, I would... I would be thrilled if they found more money to give us uh, to run our facility because they cut us almost $500,000 this year. And uh, I don't think the end is in sight at this point in time from that practice. But that being said, if there was money available, um, what would we look at? Um, any new money uh, would be utilized for a combination of things. Uh, repair to a 32-year-old facility, depending on how much money it was. I mean, uh, if, if the sky is the limit, uh, there, there is a, a building that needs to be repaired that uh, the Department of Capital Asset Management uh, has, we've been doing a lot of pushback uh, trying to get them to repair the building. As a matter of fact, I spent about 45 minutes on the phone this afternoon with uh, the engineers from DCAM uh, regarding that process. But uh, over and above that, we have contract responsibilities that we have to take care of every year with the staff. And the state, and possibly most people don't realize this, the state negotiates the contract and they tell what amount of money is going to be paid out, and it's paid out on a six-month basis to staff. So the employees are getting a raise every six months, and they have not funded those raises over the last four years. And so that becomes a problem in itself. So, uh, so having, having new money, we'd have to take care of business first and then go from there. Thank you. Um, Stephanie? The current Hampshire County House of Corrections and Jail is at 80% occupancy. This allows space for the state to pay, for the, pay the county for housing Department of Corrections state prisoners. There are currently 26 state prisoners in Hampshire County House of Corrections. In your opinion, what is the right balance of county versus state prisoners? Do you favor increasing occupancy? Kevin Lewis? The, the, from my experience, the biggest issue is, um, once again, beds, um, you know, space for these, these inmates. I mean, um, I know uh, throughout the nation, there's, there's a lot of overcrowd uh, prisons and jails. and um, so that's something to really kind of pay attention to. Um, but am I for bringing, you know, state prisoners to our local jails? Yeah, as long as they, they're paying us for it, yeah, absolutely. Um, so, you know, they're, they're not just going to throw them, you know, in our lap and just say, here, take care of them. So, uh, so yes. Mr. Kaling? We are not in a money-making business. That's a reality. We do not get paid for the state prisoners that are housed in our facility. Most of the state prisoners that are housed in our facility either come from this community, were sentenced to state prison, and are being sent back to this community to re-enter society, hopefully safer than when they, when they got to the state prison system. And we also house clients, I would say, more than anything else, who are uh, on the last step on a road to recovery from some of the other counties that are close by who cannot 
uh, reacclimate into their own uh, neighborhood. So we do not get paid for uh, the state uh, inmates that come to our facility, but we do step them down the same way we step down uh, our own uh, clients and get them in back into the community uh, in the best possible condition we can. Can I just clarify about the occupancy question? Are you talking about increasing overall occupancy at the jail or increasing the number of state prisoners that we bring in? Um, I guess the state prisoners you bring in or occupancy in general, filling the, since it's at 80% occupancy. Okay, yeah. all right, thank you. Um, so I also um, certainly would be okay with bringing in um, uh, people incarcerated from in the state prison into the Hampshire County Jail and Huff House of Correction as long as it was an appropriate placement. It's certainly a state facility is a different facility than the Hampshire County Jail and House of Correction and I, like I said, I would want to make sure that the people that they were sending us are appropriate. Thank you. Jane Chordek. Okay, this question is going in a little bit of a different direction, I think. Um, are you aware of the connection between diet, nutrition, and violence? What actions would you take? Mr. Kaling? Can you clarify on that? What do you mean, what action would we take? No, this was a question from the audience, so I'm not sure. Uh, all of our diets in Hampshire County are certified by a dietitian. Uh, that dietitian meets with our chefs to make sure that uh, they meet the criteria for good balanced diets. Um, so I don't know what other steps we can take just based on, a, on the way that question is asked. Well, I'm sorry. She asked if you were, or he, are you, are you aware of the connection between diet, nutrition, and violence? So I guess their question is, is there, there, to, there to, is a connection, connection between, between, there is a connection between those uh, high caloric uh, diets can cause people to become more violent based on uh, the individual makeup uh, of, uh, in, in this case, a, a prisoner situation. We don't find it as often in county houses of correction because the focus is on trying to get the person to a better place and so the balance of the diets are usually much better versus, uh, versus a, uh, where you're in a state prison system where it may be a bland diet for a long period of time where the violence can escalate. Thank you. Ms. Perry? I have um, read that. Um, I'm not really sure exactly um, what's behind it other than from a nursing perspective, I can say that with um, poor diets certainly come diseases like high blood pressure, blood sugar issues, um, diabetes, and certainly um, you can run into trouble with those illnesses as far as confusion, agitation, so that would make sense to me. And certainly I would advocate for a good diet, um, you know, a, a good diet within the Hampshire County Jail and House of Correction and would hope that that would be helpful. Um, I'm going to piggyback off of uh, what Melissa said. I, I'm totally for it. Um, but at the same time, do I think that the prisoners should be eating uh, better than uh, the students in the school system? Absolutely not. Um, but I think it's important. Health is definitely important. Um, so we would just have to kind of figure out, you know, a way to kind of balance that out. So, thanks. Thank you. Stan? Uh, there's been a lot of discussion about training for inmates, preparing them for release back into the community. Let's talk a little bit about training for staff, the correctional staff at the jail. Are there gaps in training that you see, and uh, how would you expand or otherwise improve training for staff? Mr. Kaling. All staff are required to undergo 40 hours of training each year. All correctional officers have to go through a training academy to uh, become employed full-time at the facility. Uh, gaps, we, we try to work on those gaps as much as possible. As a matter of fact, uh, I had a discussion last month with uh, uh, a, a couple of uh, more senior employees who uh, indicated that they would like to see uh, more mental health training more than uh, the training that they get on an annual basis. 
so that would be that would be one area that um, that we will look at as far as uh, making making other services available because uh, mental health is one of the important factors that we that we always look at uh, as far as uh, training for staff in such areas as their own health and well-being we try to encourage them to uh, use EAP services we try to encourage them to uh, uh, go to uh, an outside gym and and be in a proactive manner in their outside lives as far as uh, those aspects uh, we just finished uh, finished a survey and wrote a grant regarding uh, health of staff and uh, we'll be we'll be uh, getting money back to work on some other staff uh, processes in the next couple of months because of that grant thank you Cameron Lewis uh, physical fitness is is definitely something that I uh, I'm, I'm, I'm huge on um, as as well as you know, when it, when it comes to the correction officers, they're the front line of defense. And um, I think it's important that we support them as much as we can. Um, I've been there and I know exactly uh, what, what, it, what it feels like. Um, so with, with that being said, uh, health, um, when it comes to, these, these correction officers most of the time are stressed out. And we have a uh, high rate of you know, alcoholism, substance abuse, suicide, et cetera, et cetera. And I think it's important that we kind of look out for these uh, individuals as well. Thank you. Thank you. I actually am a huge proponent of education for the staff, and I wished I had said that when uh, they asked about monies because I do believe um, offering um, several educational opportunities to staff gives them better tools to work in the environment that they're working in. And right now we're scurrying around trying to train police officers and correctional officers in mental health and substance abuse. And it's a real struggle because these men and women have not had the training or the background to be able to deal with the issues that are presented before them today. And like I said, absolutely I have access to several different areas of training opportunities and educational opportunities around mental health and substance abuse and would like the opportunity to be able to offer it to the correctional officers at the Jail and House of Correction. Thank you, Stephanie. Do you believe we should um, increase the time of family visit and do you think the type of family visit that is now provided adequate for the Hampshire County House of Corrections? I'm not really sure exactly how the family visit works in uh, Hampshire County, um, but uh, increasing it uh, so that they can visit their families more often, absolutely. Um, they're humans as well and they have feelings as well and I think it's important that we, we don't you know, completely isolate them from uh, their family, especially we're, we're talking individuals that weren't able to see their, uh, their, their child be born. And, you know, they want to bring the kid in there and uh, see. But then there's the uh, security issue as well where, you know, passing contraband and so on. So those are things that we also got to uh, put into play as well. Ms. Perry? Absolutely, um, I would um, support as much visitation as we possibly could afford at the Hampshire County Jail and the House of Correction because I think the family actually would also be extremely helpful to the in, uh, person who was incarcerated um, rehabilitation. I a actually have had some personal experience um, visiting at the Hampshire County Jail and House of Correction and I believe, unless it's changed, there's only one room for families to gather. Um, the rest of it is an open air visiting area where there, everyone has their visitor right next to them. There are children everywhere and uh, there are um, correctional officers at either end of the room watching. And like I said, if there is any way to make that a better experience for everybody, I certainly would try. Mr. Palin. The Hampshire County Jail and House Correction has the only facility that has contact visits. We chose to do that specifically to keep the families together as much as possible because we believe that the family is an important factor in getting these people back to their normal lives and getting them to be, to be productive citizens. There is a balance in all of this as to how much time we can uh, utilize. Family visits, there is a special room set up uh, 
four family visits where mothers, fathers, and children can visit together. They can play, they can uh, communicate. We also have a program uh, that's run by the staff that is specific family visits where they learn to do programming with their own child. Because what we've discovered is that a lot of these individuals uh, have not had developed parent skills. And those developed parent skills are very important going forward if the person is going to reconnect with them on the outside. And so during that process, uh, we, we discovered by utilizing the, a local company, I hope they don't get upset at me, but uh, A to Z, a to Z um, who has volunteered services uh, to help train uh, staff and to work with the, uh, the clients that qualify for the program. Thank you. It's your turn, Jean. Okay. Um, what, would, what would you bring to this job that is unique among the candidates? Melissa oh, Perry? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> I keep forgetting to look at you. <laughs> I'm thinking about my, my answer. Um, I actually think that my um, excellent interpersonal skills, my leadership skills, um, and the fact that I was nominated and um, chosen as the number one leader of Valley Health Systems um, certainly gives me an edge. Um, my ability to work with public agencies um, like the Department of Mental Health, Department of Public Health, and I have a unique knack of bringing those agencies together in a room and coming up with solutions to problems. And I think, like I said, I think I, ha I would have a, certainly a, a, an ability to, to do that at the Hampshire County Jail. Well, unique is a tough word to use. Uh, on a daily basis, uh, we have to work as a team at the Hampshire County Jail uh, because that's, that's how we get it to, uh, to run. And everybody plays a part, uh, whether it's the correctional officer providing safety for uh, the staff and the inmates or the treatment person who is making sure that uh, uh, they um, take care of the inmates' needs. So. I become the person who has to make sure that all of the pieces work together. So uh, I have a uniqueness in that I, I think I can uh, build a good puzzle and keep the puzzle pieces together and keep them working in a functioning uh, society inside of our society that nobody else wants to really uh, become involved with. My, uh, I bring a little bit of diversity into uh, this mix. Um, I, you know, with that being said, I think it's uh, it's important that you know here as in Hampshire County we call ourselves extremely diverse, but you know we don't even have a uh, our first African American politician in this county. Um, so I think it's important that we the sheriff's department reflects um, the county itself. Um, Training wise, you know, I, I, you know, being a correction officer and being a police officer, I've seen two different sides, um, you know, and, you know, just having my personal experiences as well um, in the neighborhoods, you know, I can tell you, you know, going to Amherst, you know, I can tell you what certain individuals are, uh, are dealing with within that community, you know, depending on the community and whatnot. And I think it's important that, you know, uh, the leader of this county is somebody that, can say, hey, I know exactly what this individual is going through. I know what this community is going through. Um, you know, thank you. Thank you. Um, Stan Moulton? Uh, each of you has said that you favor reviewing the policies that govern pretrial detention at the jail with the, with the goal of reducing the number of people who are held. How would you accomplish that goal? I would have to um, uh, look at that and um, come up with ways and work, like I said, with agencies to try and figure out alternatives, um, keeping people at home, um, possibly awaiting trial, keeping them um, or getting them treatment prior to um, their trial. And um, I guess those are the ways I would work hard in trying to um, get that number reduced. Uh, it depends on their crime. Um, I'm, I'm 
on board with Melissa where she said, you know, keeping them uh, home uh, instead of being in our jail. Um, you know, I, th I think it's important that we give these individuals a chance because, you know, I know the motto here in America is, you know, uh, innocent until proven guilty. But, you know, if you're already incarcerated and you haven't even went through the court system, you're already guilty. Um, and that's the perception that it's giving off. Um, and I think it's important to give these individuals a chance. Once again, I am a big believer on depending on the crime. Because uh, if you're out there committing a violent crime, then you know, the, the, the community is not safe with you in it particularly. So um, that's my answer for that. Mr. Kaling. I would suggest to you, if you looked at the statistics over the last uh, 10 years in Hampshire County, uh, we have already made that change. That's why we're at an 80% capacity and not 120% capacity. Part of that has been through uh, a graded effort uh, by the courts in Hampshire County, uh, the prosecutors in Hampshire County, the defense attorneys in Hampshire County, and uh, our staff. Uh, we had what used to be called the Overcrowding Action Commi Committee that met on a monthly basis with the local judges and the local probation departments. And that overcrowding action uh, committee would go back through some of the cases that may be held on low bails, some of the people that we looked at that could be moved on to other uh, uh, situations outside of uh, being held at the facility. That, that was an ongoing project and uh, part of that, part of that co cause and effect was reducing to 80% of the population. Stephanie? What services, classes, and programs does the Hampshire County Jail provide for pretrial detainees? Do you think these services are adequate? Mr. Lewis? Not too familiar exactly what type of programs they currently uh, have here in uh, the House of Corrections, so. Mr. Kaling. At the present time, the pretrial pre population uh, has services, uh, including uh, Alcoholics Anonymous and, and NA, and they have some educational services based on their educational level. One of the, one of the problems that happens with pretrial populations is that they become uh, almost a transient population in that they may be here for two days, they could be here for one day, or they could be here for one year. We never know from day to day. So providing with the, them with educational services and providing them with, uh, with long-term planning services that may be an eight or 10 week program uh, is not always the best route to go. Uh, so what we do is we evaluate each individual when they come in to see what services that we can utilize for that individual based on the possibility that they may be there for a longer period of time or a shorter period of time. Ms. Perry? Um, as far as uh, pre-trial, certainly I believe that they should be offered group programming. And I would see it as an opportunity to bri kind of bridge them into um, educational services. And I know the Hampshire County Jail has a lot of um, affiliations with educational um, facilities as well as um, substance abuse uh, facilities and um, uh, programming programming opportunities. So again, I would see that as an opportunity to set that person up, um, even if it's just for a short period of time, I would try and figure out a way to do that. Thank you. Jean? I have a lot of good questions here. Um, what is your vision for the future of the sheriff's office the vision for the future um, corrections is changing in America and it's changing throughout the world and we we are on the cusp of that change I would believe that within the next 10 years you will see that most of uh, what we know as brick-and-mortar facilities especially on county levels and in smaller jurisdictions will be changed to some sort of a community-based programming 
where uh, more and more electronic monitoring will be utilized, uh, where the individuals who can be placed back safely in the community uh, understand that safety of everybody else, everybody in this room would like to go to sleep at night and not know that uh, or know that they are safe. And so based on that, the court makes a decision on who goes to an incarceration process and who doesn't. So I think what we will see in, in the future, because we're going that way already in Hampshire County, is more and more people will be on electronic monitors in the community or in some sort of a group home type situation under supervision of some sort of a correction system. Thank you. Melissa Perry? I agree with Patrick and I, I do hope that's the direction that we take. Um, certainly um, my vision would be you know, for the facility that we currently have to um, foster a very positive environment for the correctional officers, the treatment staff, and the people who are incarcerated for right now. That's what I would do. But again, I agree with Pat. I think that's the way we're going. And I would hope that we could work on making sure that those folks are in the appropriate placement. Again, I'm all for keeping people who are danger to themselves or others um, if we need to keep them incarcerated, we, I mean, we need to do it, but again, we need to do it with respect and dignity. And for those folks who can be managed in the community, absolutely, I'm, I'm for that. I agree as well. Um, ankle bracelet, I, 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 that's, that's probably the best bet. Um, you know, I, I think it's definitely important that we, you know, keep the most violent individuals in our, our jails and these uh, other individuals on um, these ankle bracelets. Um, you know, in the future of not just the jail, but just the, sh the, the sheriff's office itself, um, I definitely see the sheriff's office doing a lot more in the community, um, in the broad aspect of you know assisting uh, its local law enforcement in you know without stepping on their toes, um, and educating our youth as well, um, because you know I'm a teacher in the Amherst Pelham School District and. You know, a lot of things that I keep hearing is, uh, you know, a lot of bad things about the uh, police that the youth has to say. Um, and just letting them know that these are individuals that they can trust and uh, go to uh, when they have issues, if they have nobody else uh, to turn to. So that's the future that I see. Thank you. Stan? I'm going to follow up on that question. Um, that sounds like a, 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 an interesting philosophy of, of change in the, in the correctional structure, community-based program. It also sounds to me a lot like we heard some 30 years ago as the state hospital here and elsewhere was being emptied in favor of more community treatment. How would you as sheriff ensure safety in the community and that there were sufficient programs to take the place of the brick and mortar? Mr. Kaling. I would suggest to you that I'm doing it today with the Bridge to the Future House, the 16-bed program that is in the community uh, where I had to bring the community together and bring them into the facility and have a discussion with them because they were afraid of what was going into their neighborhood. And after the discussion, uh, as a matter of fact, I, I happened to be with my father-in-law last Saturday and uh, it's, it's great to uh, get my father-in-law out, but uh, he was out with me and uh, one of the women from the neighborhood uh, of where the Bridge to the Future house is said to me, and, and this was out of town, I didn't recognize her at first, but she said to me, we're really thrilled with what you guys are doing next door. You're keeping it safe and you're doing it right. I can't. I can't ask for anything more than that, uh, but we are doing it, and we're doing it the way it should be done, safely and with dignity and humanity, and we get those people into a job. We're getting them into programming in the community. We're getting them treatment services in the community, and we're connecting them with sponsors and mentors in the community. And you know what? We live in a great community because there are people that are asking us all the time, how can we help? How can we, how can we work with this process? And that's where I think I will be uh, an advocate to get more and more people into the community that way.
Thank you. Kevin Lewis? Having trust in uh, law enforcement is something that we definitely have to gain uh, as of right now. Um, and, you know, that's, that's the first thing is reaching out to the community and educating them about um, the Sheriff's Department and other law enforcement agencies so that uh, we can have a mutual understanding when it comes to uh, letting these individuals out. Um, and, you know, like, like the saying says, if you see something, say something. And um, I think, you know, that's, that's, that's a good philosophy when it comes to uh, our community is, you know, if you see anything that uh, out of the ordinary that this particular that we released um, has done, then, you know, definitely let us know. Um, certainly um, educating the public around what we're trying to do would be a priority for me and from my perspective in order to maintain it I think what we would need to do is make sure that we kept good statistics and make sure that we continually went after funding to maintain these programs I think that's where we struggle in the state of Massachusetts we fund things and then after a while we lose funding so again I think it would be my priority to make sure that I have good statistics that I can present to the Department of Corrections so that I could keep the budget the way it is and keep the programming going and also seek alternatives to funding such as grants, um, et cetera, again, which I have um, done for the hospital. So there's money out there I think that we could find and I would work really hard to try and find it. Thank you. Stephanie? This is an audience question. Um, beyond the GED program, are there any certificate or community college degree programs available? either in an outside or in the community? Kevin? If I'm not mistaken, I believe that uh, the Sheriff's Department has uh, something with, um, I believe it's Amherst College, uh, Smith or Amherst College, um, uh, to get their degrees and whatnot. Uh, I'm not too familiar with it in particular, but um, that's something that I was aware of. Um, I don't know about whether or not there's more certification programs, but I do know Hampshire County has affiliations with Amherst College, University of Massachusetts, I believe Hoyle Community College and Greenfield Community College. And I know there's educational opportunities offered. Um, I'm just not sure what type of certificates are offered other than the GED. Thank you. Mr. Kalin. There was a, in speaking of certificates, there was an article in the newspaper in the Daily Hampshire Gazette on Saturday where they spoke to the topic of uh, certification and serve safe, uh, which is uh, an important factor in getting somebody back on their feet. Uh, the serve safe program, which uh, can bring a person into a workplace right away, into a restaurant business, and have a certificate right there that they can show a business owner that they're prepared to come to work. Uh, that, that's just one example. We do have a, an Amherst College program uh, with, it's called the Inside Out program, where students from uh, Amherst College come to the facility with the professor and the inmates on the inside uh, participate in a regular class. They get credits for that towards a degree at Amherst College. They can also transfer those credits to other, other colleges. We also work with the University of Massachusetts on uh, nursing and medical issues and education and we work with the community college uh, in getting individuals uh, from uh, the minimum security and pre-release into both certification programs and regular classroom if they qualify to do so. But our first goal for any group of individuals is to ensure that they reach the level of being high set certified so that they can continue with an education if they choose to do so but our case managers work to make sure that that, that happens. Thank you. Jean? To follow up on nutrition, does the jail have a garden? And if you don't know if the jail has a garden, would you support a garden? Uh, and does it use uh, the food in their facility meals? Does it source any foods from the local community? Um, increased community connections. Ms. Perry. I don't know currently if the jail has a garden. I do know growing up um, with my grandfather, Sheriff Boyle, that they did have gardens that they, um, and they had a pig farm. And um, they used the, um, the vegetables from those gardens. And um, 
Certainly, I would advocate, if we don't already, um, to use local providers for our food source for the jail. At the present time, we do not have a garden. Uh, oddly enough, it's one of the uh, discussion topics that we're having with the University of Massachusetts. But uh, if you've driven by 205 Rocky Hill Road, you'll notice that there's some construction going on out in the front of the facility. And uh, we have to get through that construction phase before we can move forward with the University of Massachusetts. Uh, but we have uh, an individual from the community by the name of Donna Zucker who uh, has been fantastic in working with us on projects such as uh, the, uh, the future farm that um, may be placed in the back of the facility outside of the perimeter fence. We also have a labyrinth which is inside the, uh, the fence uh, which local, local people donate uh, uh, some of their plants to so that we can uh, uh, continue a mindfulness program with the inmate population. And uh, there's a group out of Connecticut that, uh, uh, and I can't remember their name, that approached us this past six months to, um, to see if they would produce, uh, if they could donate seeds for gardening if we, were to, if we were to start a program in the next year. Thank you. Mr. Lewis? I think gardening is a really good idea. Um, I, you know, it's, it's definitely um, uh, something that's soothing to a lot of people, including myself. Um, you know, and outsourcing in the community itself, uh, I, th I think it's a great idea to investing in our community and not outsourcing in um, other um, for-profit uh, organizations. Um, you know, and that has to do with, you know, getting, whether it's milk and, you know, vegetables and different things like that, um, you know, from these local farms, you know, supporting our community. I think that's something that we should pay more attention to as well. Um, on the other aspect, it's, you know, um, I said that before, and a lady said, well, you know, the inmates are going to be eating better than us. Um, and uh, I agree. Um, but at the same time, I suggest them do the same thing. Same thing in our school system. We should probably do the same thing. So. Can I have uh, 30 seconds on this one? Yes. Thank you. Uh, there's a little process in Massachusetts is called the bidding laws, and we're required to bid out for produce, for vegetables, for uh, bread, milk, all of those products. We would love to enter into agreements with local pr uh, producers of foods if we could do so, and if those, if those people could produce it and sell it to us at the same price that we, uh, we have to be bound by law to take. So that is one of the, uh, the issues, because we do believe investing in this community. And the police departments and, and any of the other agencies we work with uh, would tell you that. Thank you. Stan? What, what's, the, uh, what's the one aspect of the correctional system that you're familiar with um, that you could change as sheriff that uh, you think isn't working as well as it could, and, and how would you change it? Melissa Perry? Well, again, incarcerating those folks with behavioral health and substance abuse issues is certainly a really hot topic for me. And again, finding alternatives um, to those um, folks who could get treatment in other places. Um, I'm going to have to go with nepotism. Um, I, I, you know, I, working in the uh, prison that I worked at, you know, I'm pretty familiar with it. And, you know, favoritism on certain officers, I think that's something that needs to be changed. Um, just because, you know, your, your cousin's grandmother's friend, uh, just because you know them doesn't mean that they get a promotion or, you know, and things like that. And I think that's something that's really important because, you know, they work just as hard as you did. And uh, people need to understand that. And, uh, you know, the favoritism is just, that's, that's something that's, that's definitely killing the system. Stan, could you repeat the question, please? Uh, yes, uh, I'm asking what one aspect of the correctional system that you could uh, control as sheriff uh, do you think isn't working as well as it could, and how would you change it? That's a difficult one because uh, I have worked very hard with Sheriff Garvey to make sure that we produce the best product as, as a business in Hampshire County that we can 
so that we can make things work uh, within the community. So that's, that's a tough question. Um, probably letting the community know what we do more so than uh, we have in the past would probably be uh, one of those areas that I, I probably would change because uh, there are most of the things that we've discussed even tonight and in past debates are things that we have been doing for over the last 30 years. And we, we have broke stride with many of uh, the other facilities who were in a mode in the 80s and 90s of warehousing. Uh, we continue to do work release programs and we continue to do community interactions and community work programs uh, where the inmates went into city halls and went into police stations and fire stations uh, to uh, make sure that uh, we, we had those uh, individual clients giving back to the community which they had taken something from. So, uh, so I guess making sure that people know what the Hampshire County Jail and House of Correction is all about with that, without uh, disrespecting dignity of the individuals would be my goal. Thank you. Stephanie? Another audience question. Should the jail provide people with opioid use disorder with medication assisted treatment such as methadone and suboxone? Mr. Lewis. Hmm. Hmm. Um, as of right now, as far as I know, um, and uh, my personal opinion, I, I don't I don't really think so. Um, and the reason why is because they shouldn't be there in the first place. Um, you know, I mean, there is medical staff there for a reason, but, you know, most of these individuals are already addicted to an opioid as it is. Um, so we don't need to kind of feed onto their habit in particular, and, you know, m which will make them relapse. So, no. Mr. Kaling? Suboxone and uh, methadone are alternatives to, uh, to opioid addiction. Uh, we have taken a course of action where we've started a program with Vivitrol. And anyone who's familiar with Vivitrol, it, uh, it appears to be the best case scenario for opioid addicted people to kick the habit. It's a shot that, get, that they get once a month and uh, once they step back into society, they can get that shot from a clinic on the street. Mass Health will pay for that shot. And it, it subdues some of the receptors in the brain to prevent them or at least cause them not to end up in a situation where uh, they, they want to go back to using uh, drugs. So yes. If it were Vivitrol, I would I would be a hundred percent with it. If uh, because we we utilize it, uh, I'm not a big proponent of uh, uh, methadone uh, because there there have been uh, some some situations where uh, methadone has been abused. We know Suboxone is abused because uh, they try to get it in through the mail and through uh, other venues, including uh, in from court. Uh, so that they can uh, utilize it inside the facility. So uh, for, for us, uh, Vivitrol would be the, uh, the route of go uh, we would go. Thank you. Absolutely, I would be an advocate. Um, certainly, I do like Vivitrol, um, the concept of Vivitrol. However, if needed, methadone um, and Suboxone methadone is certainly the safest um, medication for withdrawing pregnant women. So I absolutely would want to make sure that that was available. And I believe actually it should be used because although not deadly, opiate withdrawal is horrible to watch and horrible to go through from what I understand. I've seen many people going through it and it, like I said, it's very difficult to watch and I would not want to put a human being through that if I could possibly prevent it. Um, and so, like I said, I would advocate for, the, for its use. And people who um, use methadone, Suboxone, and now Vivitrol have the highest rate of success of recovery. If they detox using medication, rehab using medication, 
halfway houses and support groups, again, they have the, the best success rate um, for um, uh, success, successfully coming off opioids. Thank you. Can I grab 30 seconds on this? Yes. Yeah. Um, the Hampshire County Jail and House of Correction do not house pregnant females, so uh, the pregnant female issue would not be a, a situation that we would be dealing with. Um, there is another alternative uh, for people that are we're, that you're weaning off of uh, substances, and uh, that would be the use of Librium is, is another possibility. Thank you, Jean. And this will be our final question before we have your final statement. Okay. Yeah. What do you believe is the jail's greatest strength, and what is its biggest problem? and how would you try to solve it? Mr. Kaling. The greatest strength is the people that work there. Uh, coming to work every day makes me proud. I, we couldn't ask for a better staff. Uh, they work hard, they try hard, they, they spend most of their time dealing with situations that most people in the outside uh, would never want to deal with. And, uh, that's from correctional officers, uh, the chefs, uh, the treatment staff, uh, all of those people, the nursing staff, all of those people have to work together. Uh, that is the greatest strength of the organization. Uh, and it's not any one person, it's the group of people working as a team. And when the team works well, everything goes well. Um, and that's, that's a reality. Uh, I, I apologize, what was the second part of that? Oh, and what, what is its biggest problem, and how would you try to solve, solve that big problem? Right now, the, probably the biggest problem is uh, the condition of uh, the modular unit. And, and like I said, it's going to take us a continued push to the uh, Department of Capital Asset Management to get that resolved. That, that's the biggest ongoing day-to-day -day problem at this point in time. Uh, okay. Thank you. Melissa? Um, I would also um, agree with Pat on that. I absolutely applaud the staff who work in the correctional system. Um, I think it's a very difficult job. And I think um, along with the facility, um, the uh, biggest um, thing that needs to be addressed is I think staff training. Because again, if I can get the staff well trained, they're gonna feel good about their job and they're going to um, have the tools necessary to be able to deal with those people who are incarcerated. Mr. Lewis. I'm also gonna to have to agree with uh, the staff. Uh, you know, without the staff, it, the, the jail wouldn't run correctly, especially these correctional officers. Um, like I said before, they're the front line of defense. Um, and uh, when it comes to training, um, you know, that's, that's, that's one thing that I think uh, corrections, as correction also as a whole is lacking, you know, you know whether it's diverse training, whether it's uh, de-escalation, de-escalation um, de and whatnot. And I think it's important that we, you know, give these correction officers an opportunity um, to, you, you know, take time off because it's a very stressful job and it takes a certain type of individual to do that type of job. And not, you know, like I said, not, not everybody can do it. So um, when it comes to training and giving uh, you know, resources to these correctional officers. That's something that I would definitely say would change. Thank you. And now we'll do closing statements. Um, and Mr. Lewis, you get to do the first one. Second one, sorry. Mr. Kaling, you go first <laughs> for your closing statement. <laughs> Do we want to redraw? <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you all for uh, hosting this. Uh, these are very interesting times. Uh, part of any new administration is to assess a new facility or any facility when they take over. Based on all of the feedback that I've had over the last six months in this community, the people have told me one thing that we do a very good job at 205 Rocky Hill Road, and they're very pleased with the services that we provide based on the budget that we have from the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. 
That being said, as a new administrator, one of my responsibilities would be to review all of the operations of the department when I took over. I am the one candidate in this race who understands the sheriff's department and how this department functions and how it has to function under state law. I am the candidate who works full time in the criminal justice system. I have studied matters of criminal justice for most of my career at Westfield State and at Western New England uh, where I did receive my uh, master's degree in criminal justice administration. I am the only person in Western Massachusetts with a certification from the American Jail Association in, uh, as a jail administrator. I continue my education every year. Whoa, that was fast. I think you chipped me out of time. Uh, uh, the role, the role that the uh, voters play in this election is clear. They're the hiring panel. All of you are, are members of that hiring panel. So, I am the only person in this race that has a background and hands-on training and experience to lead this department on day one. So I would ask for your vote on September 8th. I thank you for your consideration, and I can be uh, reached at uh, klaneforsheriff.com. Thank you very much. Your turn. This race is about change, and we all know that. Um, the Sheriff's Department is in a unique position to do so much, uh, so much good. And I think it's important that you know, the Sheriff gets involved in the community without stepping on the toes of our law enforcement. I think it's, it's important that we understand the role of the Sheriff, educating the youth about the sheriff department, educating our community as whole about the sheriff's department. Um, I was a correctional officer, and as a person with, at the front line of defense, it's a tough job. It's a really tough job. And to be able to understand that, a, a lot of people can't. You know, we have correctional officers that commit suicide every single day because of this job, and we need to be able there and support them. As your next sheriff, I hope to do that. Um, and as your constitutional officer here within the county as well, issues that you may have, you go to the sheriff. Talk to the sheriff about that. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Melissa Perry. Um, I do um, understand that Patrick has been in the correctional um, system for 30 years, but I wonder and often think about whether it's time for a fresh face with fresh ideas, and I certainly am a game changer. As a person, my skills as a leader, my interpersonal skills certainly would be beneficial to the role of the sheriff. Again, I am an excellent leader. I would like to offer for both the staff and the people incarcerated at the Hampshire County Jail and House of Correction, a very positive, safe, and secure environment. I would again like to provide educational and vocational opportunities for people who are incarcerated, as well as the staff offer them ongoing trainings. And again, I believe it's time for a fresh face. Thank you. I'm now going to have um, Cynthia Brubaker, who's the uh, member of the League of Women Voters of Amherst, make a closing statement. First, thank you for sitting through the heat for the last hour and a half. So this will be very short. Uh, thank you for coming. Thank you to the candidates and to the panel who asked our questions. Um, we hope that this information will help you in, in your choice of who you will vote for. You can watch tonight's program on Northampton Cable TV or Gazette web site. It'll be shown on that also. Um, you'll be voting in the primary on September 8th. 
And again, the general election will be on November 8th. Polls are open from 7 a.m. until 8 p.m. And in this year, in November, will be the first time that Massachusetts voters can vote up to 11 business days prior to the election. So you will be able to vote up to 11 days before the general election. Um, and there's no longer any excuse for anyone to say it's inconvenient, because you can get there for 11 days. Uh, if you have not registered to vote, back on the table, this is a, a card that shows you, uh, you can take and you can register online. So pick one of those up in the back if you haven't registered. And if you have moved within the last year and changed your precinct, you need to re-register with your current address. So thank you all for coming and thank you for enduring our heat in uh, Northampton. Thank you.